Thank you for joining us today for the 14th annual McCarthy Lecture. A renowned academic, author, and promoter of democratic justice, we are deeply honored and grateful to have Kathleen Hall Jamison as the speaker for our 14th annual Eugene McCarthy Lecture. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, but the, I, I, instead of asking the question, how did the Russians help elect Donald Trump? I'd like to reframe the analysis to ask, what can we learn by the kinds of interventions they used to try to influence us about the ways in which interventions of that sort, they wouldn't necessarily have to be from Russia, can potentially influence us as voters. And, and the process to ask, how can we increase the likelihood that we're not going to be susceptible to them? Now, I know some of you are Republicans and some of you are Democrats, so I want to ask you to do something for me. I want you to step back and stop thinking about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and just think the Russians don't really care whether a Democrat or a Republican is in the White House. The Democrats want to, they want to do a good job for the country. The Republicans do, too. What the Russians want to do is do a good job for Russia. So the Russians want to make the U.S. look bad. And so this is going to be the st basic structure I'm going to talk through in the next 30 minutes or so. In cable systems across the country, you'll see RT. You'll see it in your hotel rooms when we go back to ever being in a hotel. RT is formerly Russia Today. That means that we've got a, an outlet in our living rooms and hotel rooms in which the propagandists in Russia are actually talking to us directly. And if you don't know that RT means Russia Today, they changed the name, but RT is really Russia Today, you might actually be subject to propaganda and no, no, not know that you are. The same thing with Sputnik, which is largely known as a radio channel in the United States. And then you've got patrol activities. They're largely covert. Those are the people pretending to be us in cyberspace. You've also got the Russian hackers. Those are covert as well. We don't see them. Now, remember, RT and Sputnik, you can go watch them. They're out here in the open. The trolls and hackers, oh, they're working behind the scenes. And also, we have an, an integrated campaign that was set to be dropped on the American people when Hillary Clinton won the presidency as well. So what's the first lesson? Look for foreign interference any place we've got a social media audience for them to try to reach. But part of what they're trying to do is to find the people whom they want to give messages to. When you respond by liking and sharing something, you're telling them something about you. And that raises another point for me. If a first is source matters, so watch out to make sure the source really is what you think it is. A second is that what you've got is. When trolls communicate to you and they suggest that they're like you, they are now able to aggregate you into groups and target you with other kinds of information. And when they target you with information, even if there's information of that kind already out there, imbalances in information, imbalances in content potentially create effects. Now, they don't create effects on everybody. They create effects on people who are susceptible to them. And in most elections, our minds are made up. We're Democrats or we're Republicans. We pretty much know which side we're going to vote for. On average, 90% of those who say they're Democrats will vote for the Democrat. And on average, 90% of those who say they're Republicans will vote for the Republican. So that doesn't leave a whole lot of people who aren't already pretty much having their mind made up. But those independents are more easily persuaded. They're not as tightly anchored to party. And they're trying to, within these three groups, create message imbalances so that you hear more bad stuff about Hillary Clinton. Largely, they're not saying good stuff about Donald Trump. Largely, they're saying bad stuff about Hillary Clinton. And the message imbalances are trying to push people who might otherwise not go to vote to vote. There's a difference between trying to persuade someone who's going to vote about how to vote and people who are going to, not going to vote or vote, we don't know whether they should or should not vote. There's a different kind of messaging. So one is a mobilizing, demobilizing. The other is, okay, I know you're going to vote. I want to shift you the way I want you to go. When you take a message from social media and you transfer it to your friends, you share, or when you like it, you are signaling that it is an important message. And when you send it and you share it, your credibility is certifying the message. So a really successful troll campaign gets you to share troll content. Now you're not asking that first question, what is the source? Because they know the source. The source is you. The second thing we need to worry about is right now we know the Russians are trying to hack into a political accounts. 
And our press made possible whatever effect the hackers had. So did uses in the campaign. But the failures of the press were really large and egregious. Reporters failed to source the content that they got through hacking to either the Russians or Julian Assange, the co-founder of WikiLeaks, who was in fact putting the materials out. They downplayed or ignored the October 7th confirmation that the Russians were behind the hacking. Reporters failed to note the lack of independent verification of the hacked content. Now, these are basic journalistic norms. The hacked content wasn't subject to tests of newsworthiness in any traditional sense. Hacked content was altered. It altered the media agenda. And last, at key moments, reporters took hacked content out of context. Now, why, why would they do this? They're not trying to elect or defeat somebody. I believe they're just simply overwhelmed. All that content is dumped on them. All the other news is turning around them. They were acting really, really quickly, and they made some serious mistakes in the process. Well, in essence, by laundering the material through WikiLeaks, the Russians managed to distance themselves from it, and reporters didn't write as many of the kinds of stories as they should have about the Russian origin of hacked content, and did not, as a result, ask the question, what is the advantage that Russia would gain by having Donald Trump elected, if any? So what's the lesson? Our press confronted with hacking needs to be extraordinarily careful because in the process of what it covers, it can set a media agenda. The fourth piece, discredit the Clinton presidency. Here we go. They breached our electric, our electoral infrastructure and they left fingerprints. Why would Russians leave fingerprints? Maybe so we could find them. Here's a question. We now know they're trying to be active inside our electoral structures right now. We've already found that out. Our intelligence you know, community says, and they think they blocked them so far. But when somebody leaves fingerprints, you wonder, were they trying to be found? They may have been trying to place malware in our voting booths. Next, they activated a troll campaign at the end of that election, alleging voter irregularities and fraud, and they insinuated sleeper personae alleging irregularities into mainstream news. Let's look. And on behalf of the McCarthy Center and St. Ben's and St. John's, thank you, Dr. Jameson, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on campus very soon. Thank you. And I'm so proud to be part of your extended community.